Hello and welcome to the Grove Church Podcast. I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor there, and we are so glad that you're joining us. Whether you are a member and you're just catching up on a sermon that you missed or you're someone who's brand new, we are really glad that you are joining us. And if you are new in some way, and I know that a lot of people will do that, will listen to sermons first before they visit, I want you to know that we would love to meet you at any point. You can join us live in our services on Sunday, 9 and 1030, or our streaming service at 1030. Either way, we would love to be able to get to know you. And regardless of why you are here uh, listening to this sermon today, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie Lofton, the lead pastor here, and really glad you're worshiping with us, whether you're joining us um, online or you're here in the room. You're new, you've been here forever, really glad all of you are worshiping with us today, and we are starting a new series today, and I'm going to start with an interesting little poll question. I learned a lot in the first service, and we'll see if it continues. How many people here would, if you, you know, on those, you know, if you take any of those personality tests, introvert, extrovert thing, how many people would say that they are extroverted? Okay, introverted. That is, that is about how it went. It was maybe even more so in the second service, way more introverts than, than extroverts. That tells me something. I got a new data point. I, when I take these things, um, I typically, if there's a range, I'll usually score almost right in the middle, like right at 51, 52, 53% extroverted, right there on the edge. But... And so they have a name for that now, Omnivert, which that sounds really cool. It sounds a little bit like a robot. But anyways, here's the thing I've realized about myself is that while I kind of on those tests, I kind of sit here in the middle, that really I think I, I, my personality is like I have the whole range and it kind of averages out to here. Let me tell you what I mean by that. You know, some people like they're just, they're just kind of like this or they're just kind of like this. But, like, I'm the guy, and this has been true for a long time, um, I'm the guy, like, if you think you're going to have, like, a karaoke party or something, and you think, I, I don't know who would go first. Like, my neighbors in St. Louis just forever ago, they didn't really know us. They didn't really even know us very well. But they knew enough to say, hey, we're throwing a uh, birthday party for my husband, and when you're having a karaoke party, will you come and go first? Like, absolutely, I will do that. And, and like, whatever it takes, like, I'll do this and just be as cra- like, as crazy or as 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 much as you need. I've 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 got that gear, but I, I it I but I'll run out. And on Sundays, it usually happens around 1:30. Like, oh, I'll be on stage, everything's great, and, and then I, and then and then then it's done. And if you see me on s- Monday morning. You'll see me. I'll be about 24 hours. I'll be at the Chick-fil-A in Springdale. I'm not inviting you. I'm not sure I'm very clear. I'm not inviting you. I'm just telling you. I'll be at Chick-fil-A, earbuds in, on my iPad, just like, don't, no one talk to me. And I, at least I think that's what I'm giving off. And this is something I've learned about me too, is that even though I think I'm in every possible way saying, don't talk to me, people will come and talk to me. And not just people I know, strangers will come and engage me in conversation. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, what I think I'm saying Leave me alone. But something about my face is saying, strangers welcome. And I don't know, I don't know what it is, and, I, and, and, I'll, and I'll do it. I'll, okay, I guess we're, we're, having, we're having a conversation now. Um, another thing I've learned recently about myself, this is actually pretty new, and I, I thought, this is one of those things that I thought was normal, and then I found out very recently that it's not. Like, if I'm about to engage in a conversation, especially if it's one that's kind of weighty, Okay, okay, I think I'm going to say this. And if I say this, there's probably three things that they'll probably say in response to that. And if they say, they say this one, then I'm, going to either, either, I'm probably going to say this or this. And then if they say this, I'm probably going to say this or this. And, then, and I'll think it out like four or five steps down the road. And by the time I've kind of thought all this through, I've got like my decision tree has like 25 to 30 possible outcomes. And I've got a plan for all of them. And very recently, my counselor said to me, that sounds exhausting. You should stop that. And I'm like, what do you mean? Everyone does. That's how ever, like, no one thinks like that. We didn't say no one, but that's kind of what I, it's what I heard anyway. It's like, and that's like, you should just say what you think and then just let the conversation unfold. I was like, but that, that sounds very risky. And now we're having this really good conversation about something that I thought was very normal, but in fact is something that is, it's something that's just going on with, with, with me. And I, what I've discovered, too, about myself is that I, I, I'm, I'm a very curious guy, very curious, and I really value 
introspection. It's kind of like just thinking deeply about who I am, what I'm doing, my motives, and all these kinds of things. And I think I've further discovered that it's something that I really value then in other people and relationships and friendships. And to kind of keep it another step further, I think something I really value and what I would like for us to be, the kind of people that are curious Wondering kind of what is, what is going on with me right now? Why, why am I feeling this way? What is going on with me? Really introspective, thinking about who I am and what it is that God wants from me and how God has designed me and, that, and that, that we would be this kind of people. And so we're starting a new series today. And normally lots of times in series, we'll just kind of start and kind of let it unfold with kind of a big, big picture. This is what we're trying to do in the end. But we're, we'll just spoil the whole thing. And say, what we're trying to do over these next few weeks is I'm inviting you to be more curious and to be more introspective about your unique design as who God has made you to be in your personality, in your spiritual gifts, in your talents, in your experiences, in the season of life, in the particular placement that God has you, to put all of these pieces together to help you more deeply understand who you are because God has called each and one of, each one of us to do and to be someone that has incredible impact on this world. I think too often we have gotten stuck in a place that we believe that um, there are special people and ordinary people. And hopefully by the end of today, and certainly by the end of this series, I hope that we can break you of that and believe that God has uniquely designed you to have incredible impact in this world, to, at its simplest, to do something to do something that can bring life and change and hope to this world, to bring Jesus and the hope of the gospel to people who desperately need it, that every person here has a significant role to play. And not to get too clever here, but I want us to be people who who have an outward focus. But in order for us to understand what I need to do in our outward focus, I need to learn to get inward and figure out who I am, but the only way that I can do that is to think upward and to think about who God is and how God has created me to be me than to do this. And so I hope that not only today, but again over the next several weeks, that you will join Mark and I and actually a few special guests over the next few weeks as we just kind of explore this idea of who you are and what God has designed you to do and be. So, we will start here in Psalm 139. It is a very popular verse. It is a very well-known verse. I, I talk about these verses from time to time. If you've been around, there are certain verses that you are very likely to find cross-stitched at your grandma's house or on a really cool poster. And this is one of them. And I don't say that to mock it because really the verses that are on these things, the reason they become powerful, inspirational verses is because there's a lot of power and inspiration in them. But, so, but very often, they can become so common that we are really missing the power of what it is that God is communicating to us. And so we'll look here at a couple of these verses, Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Again, there's beauty and power there as, as, as David here is praising God. He's praising him. It's like, hey, listen, before I knew who I was, I was, I was self-aware enough to know who I was. Before, I, before my parents even knew who I was, before I was seen by anyone but you, you are specially and uniquely crafting me in my mother's womb. You were, you crafted me. You, you saw me and you made me who I am. And then he uses this phrase, again, a very popular and powerful phrase. He says, I, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
So I want you to believe this. I want this to be something that is, that is core to what you believe about yourself and your relationship with God is that you are a unique and wonderful creation of God. That phrase, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. We're going we're gonna to grammar here for a little bit. We're going to grammar. We're going to define some terms here. Make sure that we understand. He is not saying, he's not saying that you're wonderful or that you're fearful. It's not an adjective. It's not these words fearfully and wonderfully are not adjectives describing who you are. They are adverbs describing the making process. This is how you were made. So fearfully and wonderfully describes not you necessarily. It describes the process that God went through to create you. How were you made? You were made fearfully and wonderfully. And if we were to take a dive in and kind of look at these words in particular, the Hebrew words that are used to kind of express these two ideas, the idea of fearfully is not that God was scared to make you. I don't want to stay too far. He might, maybe with some of you. He maybe was a little nervous with a few of you to make you. But that's not what he says. It it, it has the idea of great care. He took great care. He was, it was, it was a deliberate, personal, full of love, tenderness, and care. He knew what he was making. It mattered, and he gave it a tremendous amount of care. And you were also wonderfully made. And this word really is often described when it's talking about the creation of people in general, that the idea of how different and unique we are from the rest of creation. We've got a lot of inanimate objects that God created. We've got a lot of animals that really don't have a whole lot of self-awareness. We've got animals that are unable to kind of process themselves to really have a relationship with God. We have animals and we have plants and we have, we have rocks. And then we have this wonderful thing that he made. This unique thing that he made. God, uh, people created in his image for a unique place to have a relationship and a connection with God. And so it's used to kind of distinguish something from everything else. But that does not mean that the way that it is used here, when he says that I am fearfully and wonderfully made, that what, 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 what is being said is we in general as people, as people are different than all of this. We are wonderful compared to all of this. What he's saying is that you in particular you are wonderfully made. You are a unique, special creation of God. That is how you were made. You are not to be made to be one of a billion. You are not meant to be just a regular. Each one of us was created with fear and wonder with uniqueness and specialness and beauty and heart and tenderness. And I think it is of incredible importance that we move beyond this idea that, yeah, we're all just kind of, you know, people, people matter to God. But somehow in the people that matter to God, there are the special ones and the regular ones. Is that God looked at you in particular and you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And it is the beauty of your your differences and your uniqueness that make you special. And I don't know, some of you are parents and have multiple kids. Some of you may have come from multiple kid families. I don't know, but you kind of learn a little bit just kind of about the uniqueness of people when you start raising them in your own house. And you you have a kid, which we did. Uh, She'll be 26, our oldest. She'll be 26 in December. Her name is um, her name is Maylee. And um, when we had her, it's like, well, this is what when 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 Charlie and Heidi Lofton have a kid, this is what they look like. This was what a girl in our home looks like. She was very prissy. She was she was she was dressed. Dresses, always like to look great. She was, she was not a risk taker. There'd be cracks in the sidewalk, just like normal cracks in the sidewalk. And she would get down on, on she would get down and sit down and kind of scooch over it because she didn't, she didn't want to, and it, it, was, it was not a step, just, just like the normal dividers that are inside. And she, she was very particular. 
It's like, okay, well, this, this is, okay, we know what this is. We can do this. Let's have another one. And we had another girl. So we know what this is going to be like. And I promise you, it was nothing like that. That kid was insane. She is now a full-grown adult and incredibly polished and professional. And we actually were teasing her about it the other day because there was a time in her life where she would talk about that the worst insult you could give to somebody was to say that they were sophisticated. I was like, kid, you're sophisticated. And she's like, what would 12-year-old Lauren say to this, much less 2-year-old Lauren? And when 2-year-old Lauren came at you, you, if you walk them together, right? You're walking into like, and like you got this one in a pretty dress, everything's put together, and another one that has this shirt that is half tucked in, shorts that don't match, her rain boots, breakfast all over everything, hair and a me- and just coming at you, and you you should be scared. You should have been scared. You should come at. You. We used to refer to them as Princess and the Monkey. And it's funny to me, I feel, I'm figuring out this is a bit of a pattern because as I'm sitting there with my earbuds in, I'm, a, I'm, I'm watching, and I'll see it all the time. Some poor young couple, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years younger than us coming in with two little girls, princess and the monkey every time, every time. Every, it's, 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 it's amazing to me to watch people living the life that, that I once lived. So, okay, well, now we think we understand it. So then we have a third daughter that we recruited now, you don't know this, we, we were her foster parents and adopted her as a little baby. And now we figure out that there are actually some, some, a whole lot of similarities of if you're going to live in our house, we're going to do something to you. For good or for bad, there's going to be something that, that we're all going to share in common. But she's a beautiful, actually weird, fun combination of both. We joke that she is 60% Maley and 60% Lauren. He's like, bro, I thought you were a math guy. No, no, I know, 120%. And that's how much we're overwhelmed we are. And she is a beautiful, spunky, awesome little girl. And we sit and admire the beauty of their differences and how special each one of them are. Neither one of them is the right one. Neither, none of them are the special one. They are all beautiful, unique gifts that God has given us. And every one of you, every one of you, is viewed the same way by the God of the universe. And so I mentioned that I am a, um, I'm a curious guy. I'm, I'm really into the personality test and have been for a while. And they, different ones will come in and out of fashion for a while. It was Myers-Briggs. For a while, it was the DISC profile. And very recently, it has been the, the Enneagram. Are you familiar with that? It has, and all of these ha- will come in and out of, con- and they'll come out of fashion and also have some controversy attached to them, like whether or not Christians should be involved. It, they, we, we get like this, but I, I love them because they're incredible tools to kind of help us understand who we are a little bit better, to help me understand my unique flavor that I bring. And like I said, I, th- I, f- I fancy myself as a pretty introspective kind of person, and I don't expect, this is arrogant, I got, I, it really surprised me that at 50, 51, I'm still really learning like pretty shocking things about me. And I was at this seminar, uh, for uh, it was an Enneagram seminar for Enneagram 9s, which is what I am. And it was hosted by our own Alex Fitton, who is here with us today. I'm going to bring her up here in a little bit. And she was talking and she said, here's something that you guys all need to know about you. It's like, you think that you're very clearly communicating what you want and need and people are ignoring it, but you're not. People don't know because you're not clearly communicating it. Which I'm looking at it as like, what, what is she even talking about? She, she doesn't know. Like, like I, oh, I'm, I'm a professional communicator, actually, and so I'm really good at this. And so I text my wife, this is what Alex just said, and I sent it to her. And there was an awkward pause. I don't know, maybe she didn't get the text right away. Maybe I'm just only feeling the awkward pause. Maybe I'm implying it based on the response that I got. She texts back, and she's, Heidi texts back. She's like, I don't know what I'm supposed to say to this. <laughs> and it was a really interesting thing. Again, at 50 or 51 years old, I can't remember exactly when the seminar was, but it was very recent, to learn something about me and about the way I'm designed and the way that I interact with people and, 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 and my role that I play. And so it's really been an important part of my journey and kind of this introspective to, to know myself really well. And so to talk about this just a little bit, I would like to invite our very own Alex Fitton to come up here with us here for a few minutes. Let's clap her up. All right, Alex, so here's what I know. Anytime I start talking about any sort of personality test of any type with any group of people, there's always going to be a portion 
that are going to be like, okay, that, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like that. I don't want it. It's skeptical. I, I don't, I, that's, that, that doesn't really apply to me. I don't like those things. They don't really work. All sorts of skeptical things that people say. So let's assume we've got a decent number of skeptics here. And um, what would you say to them? Well, I would first say that it probably gives me a pretty good idea of what Enneagram number you might be. Got them. <laughs> also, though, I would just say I think that people in general, and this is what I experience a lot being an Enneagram coach, is that people don't want to be put in a box. And I totally get that. Um, there's a really great Enneagram teacher that I follow, and she always says the Enneagram doesn't put you in a box. It shows you the box you're already in. Um, and I really love that sentiment. The Enneagram is not trying to define you or tell you who you are in a way that's like inventive, right? They're not, it's not like, this is who I think you are, so that's how you have to pretend to be. Um, and I hear a lot of skeptics say that, that, that it's, you know, they liken it to a horoscope or something, that if it says that this is what's going to happen, then you just kind of embody that and that's mm. what makes it true, which I completely disagree with. And I think that when you, when you look at it, the Enneagram shows us our motivations behind our behavior, not just our surface level behavior. Um, and so when we look at it and we say it's just showing us nine ways of coming at the world, that can only help inform us of who we are first and then help us to be able to communicate that to other people. And then those people can communicate that right back. And that forms connection and community, which we know, especially in the church, is such a vital part of who we are and how we live. Yeah, and I was thinking about this even in the thing that I said. Oh, I, I texted Heidi, and I, and I, don't, I don't know if you remember that moment, but I, I think we talked about it afterwards even. Like, like sometimes I'll hear some things, and I'll be like, I'm, I don't know if that's me or not. Like, I hear something, and I'm like, everybody else is kind of going, mm, and I'm like, mm. and like, and it's like, so like, so like, so like, I think it's, do I have to accept it? Like, okay, I read the, okay, well, this is, well, I now, I now read this thing. Well, now this is, this is who I am. Yeah, I think that, I mean, unfortunately, since we live in a fallen world, we're really going to identify with the less healthy parts of our personality. When we hear those things, we're going to identify with those things first. But what's really cool is that when we, when we then dive into it, we want to learn more about ourselves. And when we can really get introspective with what does that mean and how can I grow from it instead of just using it as an excuse for our poor behavior, when we actually dive in, we learn about how we can take that double-edged sword of our personality and flip it to the other side and grow and use those tools the way God intended them to be used. Because he, you know, take me for an ex for example, I am a one and learning about one, it was like, yeah, yikes. Like when I was reading about some of the less great parts, I know about myself that I come at the world through a lens of anger. And I feel like, especially in the church, anger gets such a bad rap, but God made anger just like he made all of the other emotions and he can do so much with that anger when I learn to grow through it instead of just stopping there and thinking that it's something that needs to be metaphorically beat out of me or something. And I held so much shame for so much of my personality my whole life of like those are character flaws. Those are things I need to grow out of instead of how can God use those things in me? Yeah, it seems like some people have a, have a fear like hey, I, I might take one of these tests and find out I have the wrong personality. There isn't one, first of all. There is, that's, exactly, that's exactly it. I mean, it's like like I don't, I'm going to learn something about me that I that I don't want. So it makes us like I, and I I don't want to read the negative list of any of these things and find one that I identify with. Sure. So, but what? Okay. So on a, on a positive way, like as as we think about this, like what are the kinds of things? What are the kinds of things that I learn about myself? Like if I'm if I if I really just kind of start exploring some of these personality things like what are the things that I'm that I'm that I'm most likely to learn about me yeah I think that what's really cool about the Enneagram is that it shows us right it shows up shows us our motivations behind our behavior so that's kind of just the overarching theme but what we know is that especially in church culture just in culture in large we we tend to really highlight and praise and value like a couple of different kinds of personalities, right? The ones that are high energy, high impact. And when you take someone who really wants to serve God and they want, they, they love Jesus, they want to further the kingdom, they want to get involved, they tell themselves the story that they have to align themselves with one of those personality types. They have mm. to be something they're not. And all that can come out of that is burnout. And that's why you have so many people just not, not able to carry on, not able to stay with the mission. But when you take... Someone who might be less, you know, less high energy, less high impact, you know, front lines anyway. And we learn about them and we learn how to value them and plug them in where they are most gifted and we can validate that. Everyone wins there. Okay, so you're saying there's more 
personality types than preacher, musician, and likes kids? Yeah. Okay, so so, 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 so that's where we're trying to go. We're trying to go here. Like, we want to get on this inward journey to, um, to know ourselves a little bit better, but really with this idea of how God wants to use me out there. So how, how can learning more about who I am help me discover more maybe the, the way that God wants to use me in our church and ultimately in our world? Yeah, I'm, so a couple of different things. I mean, first of all, I'm going to plug the Enneagram. I think that it is absolutely just such an amazing tool for knowing ourselves and knowing other people. And so listen to podcasts, read books, come talk to me. I will talk your ear off, just fair warning. But second of all, get curious. Whenever I do trainings, I always tell people, listen to not just your own number. Listen to everybody's number because when we can, when we can come to a place in the middle, we might not agree with everyone's decision or where they're coming or why they're coming at things a certain way, if we understand their motivation, that gives us a common ground for building community. And so get curious with each other, go below the small talk, understanding motivations and understanding what someone's number is and like, okay, that tells me a lot about you. And now I know how to approach you. I understand what, where you're coming from and we can connect there. Um, so yeah, get curious and learn more. Yeah. So I, th- I think there is, there's a sense in which I learn more about me and the more I learn about me and kind of what my motivations are, then then I know kind of what my place is. So I'm I'm someone who's always looking to try to make make peace, right? And so then I learned that 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 actually has a really good thing. And sometimes, like I can be a little pushy, right? you know. I can I can I'm, I'm I stay out of my business. Like there's like I, I, I discovered this with like conflicts that happen in my home between daughters, between a mom and a daughter, or whatever. That I'm always pushing my anxiety on them and not letting, letting, letting that happen, but just kind of learning not only who I am, but learn, learn kind of then what my place is. And then based on just the unique gifts that God has given me, there's a, there's a place for me to serve. And it's not just because I put a mic on. So, so last, how do we get, how do we get over, how do we get over, do you have any advice on how to get over that? This idea that You mentioned it. I mentioned it. I'll probably mention it again here in a minute. Probably mention it every week that there are special and regular. Yeah. I think that that's something that we're all always trying to overcome. But when we can really, I mean, take you. So you're a nine, which is called the peacemaker. So you are all of the motivations for everything you do are to stay peaceful internally, but also to bring peace outside of you. So when affirmed and validated and given a stage for that, um, That is such an important gift. But what we know is that so many nines tell themselves the story that they are not impactful enough, that nobody cares, that what they have to say isn't ever going to be as important as what other people have to say. So they make themselves smaller, which is such a detriment because the world needs you guys. The world needs these great equalizers to come forward and say, hey, we can meet in the middle here. And I mean, that is the same for every other of the nine types. Um, or I guess the eight, other eight types. But when we, yeah, I think that don't stop. Don't stop at the bad things. Don't stop at the scary things. Like learning about ourselves and that self-awareness can be really hard. But when we push through that and when we learn what can I give, how can I use these gifts? Like I said, everybody wins there. And we learn more about ourselves and who God made us to be. And we can pour ourselves into that with the confidence that he wants us to have. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Alex. Yeah, so we're going to spend some time over these next few weeks, not just having to hear from me and Mark, but from a lot of different people. All of our special guests are going to be you guys, of just people that God has uniquely gifted to do incredible things. And, and to put all of this together, like it is, it is, we don't, I don't want you to walk out of here believing that this kind of all that we really talked about today was just kind of our need to know ourselves well. Because there is a deeper, more powerful part to this, and we find it in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which I think is perhaps top two, top three, maybe the number one most favorite passage in all of Scripture. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So in verses 8 and 9, he's describing the beauty of the gospel, 
that somehow we think that we need to earn God's favor, that I've got to be a certain type of person. I need to work. I need to do. And if I'm good enough, God will accept me. And he just, and he, and he crushes that. It's like, it's not based on anything that you do. The gospel, new life, salvation comes as a free gift of God, not based on any works. And as a powerful, just those first two verses are just a powerful descriptor of the amazing nature of the gospel, of the death of Jesus Christ, and what it, can, what it can mean for us when we receive it. And then what it seems almost like a bit of a plot twist and a really cool play on words. He's talking about, hey, you don't have to do any work to earn salvation. For, in fact, you are God's handiwork. You don't have to do work. You're the work. You're the work that God already did. You are a handiwork of God, a a craft, a, 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 a special, unique piece of art that God has created. Why? You are his handiwork created in Jesus to do works. And so we see this word over and over again. You are not saved by works. You are God's work. And he created you to do good works that he prepared in advance for you to walk in. What what would it look like for you to completely rethink and reimagine the purpose and the direction of your life and to completely reimagine and rethink about what your relationship with God is and for you to completely reimagine who you think you are. God is not mad at you waiting for you to be good enough. He gave his son Jesus as a free gift for you. You are not one of a billion, but a unique piece of art, a handiwork of God. And you do not walk a meaningless, purposeless life. You are not someone who is trying to survive. You are someone where God has created a path for you of good works that he wants you to just walk walk in them. Do you believe that? Do you believe that your life has been designed by God and he has created all of these opportunities for you based on who you are, the uniqueness of your handiwork, of the handiwork that you are to God. Your opportunities, your skills, your personality. He has created for you a path of incredibly good things that he wants you to do, an impact that he wants you to have in in your school, at your job, in your neighborhood, here in this church, all around the world. And if I will just walk in them. Then I can do the good things that God has uniquely designed me to do. He designed me, he designed the works, and I'm going to walk in them. And your life matters. The impact that you can have matters. And I just keep coming back to this. I, just, I, I, I don't normally do this because I'm the only one who sees it. I, don't, I usually put exclamation marks on my notes. Believe this. Two exclamation parts in my round. Believe this. Believe it. Believe that God has uniquely designed you. And he saved you as a free gift of God through Jesus Christ so that you could walk in a path of incredible impact in your your church, in your community, and in our world. Let me pray. God, I do pray. I pray that we would, would, would believe it, that we would not be hampered by our past. We would not be hampered by what we're going through right now as if favor from you is something we have to earn, if being special in your 
in your mind is something we have to earn. We were created fearfully and wonderfully by you. And we are saved and brought into your family, not based on our works, but as a free gift of your son, Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. And God, I pray that we believe that. And then based on that knowledge of being your handiwork, saved by your grace that we would believe and walk the path of works that you have for us and God that we would do something and we would do the somethings God that you have called us to do that you have prepared for us God I pray this is not something we would believe generally as a church but each one of us would believe it for ourselves. And as always, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes this possible. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us on our sermon podcast. And you can learn more about us at thegrovechurch.org. And if you go to thegrovechurch.org slash connect, there's a form you could fill out. Just let us know that you've been listening. And if you want to dig deeper on some of these topics that we cover in our sermon podcast or just in other issues of dealing with culture or theology, those kinds of things, uh, you can check out our Cultivate podcast, which is on the same feed, um, however you found this particular podcast. So again, this is Charlie, the lead pastor at The Grove, and thank you so much for joining us.